Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 360 Speaker Series. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and tonight we're kicking off Nasher Prize Weekend with a presentation from Martha Thorne, Executive Director of the Pritzker Architecture Prize. We are so excited as an institution to be launching the Nasher Prize, an annual international award created to honor a living artist whose work has enriched our vision of what sculpture can be. On the eve of our celebration weekend, we thought it fitting to share with you a perspective on the history and impact of another major discipline-based award, the Pritzker Architecture Prize. I think its resonance has been felt worldwide, especially today, and I'm so pleased that Martha Thorne could join us tonight. Thorne previously served as Associate Curator of the Department of Architecture at the Art Institute of Chicago and has facilitated architect selection processes for institutions including the Barnes Foundation, Columbia College Chicago, and Syracuse University. She is editor and author of the Pritzker Architecture Prize, The First 20 Years, among other books, and has penned numerous articles for architectural journals and encyclopedias. In addition to her role at the Pritzker Prize, Thorne is Dean of IE School of Architecture and Design Madrid and serves on the jury for the International Archivision Women in Architecture Prize. We're so honored to have her with us here at the Nasher. Please join me now in welcoming Martha Thorne. Thank you so much. It is truly a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you today. And it's a special day, as I'm sure you know, um, one of our great Pritzker Prize winners, Zaha Hadid, passed away. If you don't mind, could we just take a few minutes just to, um, just to think about Zaha, and maybe I can, in part, dedicate uh, my time with you to her. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It, it's really a pleasure to be here because your wonderful director, Jeremy, and I worked together many, many years ago. So in a way, it's sort of like coming home to become reacquainted. And it's also special because this is your weekend of celebrating the first Nasher Prize. And I think it's a particularly exciting time for you, and I'm so glad to be part of it. Um, this evening, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the Pritzker Prize, but also prizes in architecture in general. And in some ways, um, it will just be reflections on prizes, and I'm sure we can continue the conversation afterwards. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts and uh, your opinions about prizes and their role in society. Well, since I joined the Pritzker Architecture Prize about 10 years ago, I have been witness not only to all the deliberations of the Pritzker jury, um, and in those deliberations, I don't express an opinion, I don't vote, I'm like a fly on the wall, which is really a wonderful situation to be in. And over those years, I've also been in contact with many other prize organizations, and have followed the enormous growth in prizes granted to architects, to buildings, to their collaborators, to clients, to industry professionals in the broad field of architecture and the built environment. In my talk today, which I think should be more reflections on architecture prizes uh, than really a statement of where they're going or should go, I hope that some of the observations that I make might be able to give rise to a deeper analysis and debate about what is the goal, what is the worth of a prize, or at least be food for thought. Um, it, seems that, um, it seems that some of the most basic questions we consider when we look at awards have to do with why are they given, why do we like them so much? What, what or who is behind them? And if we look even at a place like Wikipedia, there are several hundred thousand prizes of all sorts given annually. Um, and obviously, there are many answers to these questions about the why, where, and how of prizes. Um, and if we seek to categorize them, we can find some categories, but then again, the uh, borders are very fuzzy, and they seem to cross over from one to another. 
As we look across the gamut of awards, past and recently created ones, it's apparent that usually there is not one reason to establish and grant a prize. In many cases today, there are the declared objectives, the secondary objectives, and then there they are the hidden objectives or hidden agendas. Um, we like to talk about prize winners. I think all of us like to, um, uh, like to second guess the juries. Um, I even heard that in Las Vegas as well as in London, the bookmakers take bets on the Pritzker Architecture Prize uh, and try to, try to guess who might be the winner. So we like to do that, and we only need to look at comments by critics and authors in the press and social media to hear criticism about prize-granting institutions and disagreement with those selected. So today, in the minutes that we are here together, I'd like to talk to you about some major architecture prizes, how I see their role, impact, and importance, and the changes in the panorama of architecture awards as we look to the future. In other words, the changing landscape and what might this mean for prize organizations and for those who win prizes or those who aspire to. So let's, take, let's start by taking a look at some of the major awards in the field of architecture. And to me, one of the main factors contributing to the recognition and success of a prize include the length that the prize has been in existence. Good decisions over a long time span grant credibility. It allows critics and those on the outside of the prize to understand the criteria as evidence through the winners and to lend weight to the prize. Of course, the purpose of the prize, the declared purpose, is another reason that we uh, can understand prizes, that we look to them and, may, and respect them. In the case of the Pritzker Prize, it is for a body of built work. The jury looks at and experiences the architecture of a number of candidates, and through that built work, they see their, the values and the aspirations and the objectives of the architect. And that objective has not changed since 1979 when the Pritzker was founded. In the case of the RIBA, the award is for a body of work rather than one building, uh, or, and, and it is, they also say it is not for an architect who is currently fashionable. In other words, it, it is for a career. The Aga Khan Award is granted every three years to projects, to buildings. And through its efforts, uh, they, the Aga Khan tries to encourage uh, future developments in the direction that, that uh, they, lend, that they uh, recognize through the prize. And that being that architecture provides not only per, for people's physical needs, but also social economic needs and stimulates and responds to cultural expectations. In the case of the Aga Khan, particular attention is given to building schemes that use local resources and appropriate technology in innovative ways. And they try to find projects that are likely to inspire other efforts in other places. Now the Premium Imperiale uh, is given it's a, a, by the Japan Art Association uh, under the auspices of the emperor and empress. And there are six nomination committees, each chaired by an international advisor who propose candidates in five fields, in painting, sculpture, architecture, music, theater, and film. And in the case of architecture, uh, sometimes the prize, the Premium Imperiali, coincides with the Pritzker Prize, and sometimes it doesn't. The most recent winner in 2015 was the French architect, Dominique Perrault. And previous to his winning, others have included Taniguchi, uh, Henning Larsen, Ricardo Lecaretta, and David Chipperfield. None of those have been granted the Pritzker as of yet. 
The um, highest award in the United States uh, that the American Institute of Architecture award, uh, awards is the AIA Gold Medal. And the, this, of course, is for long-lasting influence. Sometimes it's hard to know what influence means. And if we look over the past years, I think that they're trying to find their way. Um, and sometimes the, I think the AIA gold is a response to a situation rather than being proactive. Um, it was given this past year to Bob Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. Uh, I think that in part was a reaction to the criticism that the Pritzker did not make the award retroactive for Denise Scott Brown. Um, and there have been other cases where we could uh, discuss if the AIA gold is forward-looking or is more responsive to a situation. The Mies van der Rohe Prize is a European prize, and it's given to a building, and a building that was completed in the past few years. And it's a way of recognizing European professionals and their con contribution to the development of new ideas and technologies. Um, at the same time, I think that this prize is a way that individuals and public institutions can see the value of working together and also the cultural role of architecture. Um, the prizes I've just mentioned are granted to people or buildings, are international in scope, and I think in architecture have really a great reputation. Now, there are a couple of new international awards that have received great fanfare upon their announcement. I think it may be too early to judge their stature or their impact. And one is the Moriyama Award of the Royal Institute of Canadian Architects. And the second is the Mies Crown Hall Americas Prize. I think somebody should have told them that they needed a shorter name in order for it to be memorable. And that, that allows me just to bring up one point about the Pritzker. Um, I'm not really sure who coined the phrase the Nobel Prize of Architecture back in 1979. And I've tried to find out uh, exactly where that came from without much luck. But whoever did it really had the right idea because you remember it quickly, you understand what the prize means immediately, and it's something that can be repeated over and over again to reinforce the prize. In the case of the Moriyama or in the case of the Mies Crown Hall Americas Prize, they don't have that slogan yet. They don't have a short name. But the first uh, is a prize with a very big purse, uh, $225,000. And that's probably the largest purse in all of architectural awards. And it's awarded to an architect team of architects or an architect-led co collaboration anywhere in the world in recognition of a single work of architecture that is judged to be transformative within its society and expressive of human values of justice, respect, equality, and inclusiveness. And the first winner was a Chinese architect uh, for his, the library that he designed. In the case of the IIT College of Architecture and Illinois Institute of Technology, um, this is for mo the most distinguished architectural works built in North and South America. And it's twofold in nature. Um, there's the main prize, and then there's a secondary prize, which is awarded to emerging architects. And the jury is able to uh, take a holistic approach in, uh, what, in the definition of exceptional works. Um, and they, uh, the award in this case receives uh, $50,000, but that goes towards a publication. Along with the award of the Mies van der Rohe, uh, Mies Crown Hall, uh, is a teaching fellowship at Illinois Institute of Technology. And the uh, first winners uh, of this award, the grand prize winner and the other two, 
were here, one in the United States, one in Brazil, in South America, two in, in South America, Brazil, and Chile. Well, now, if you would allow me, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the Pritzker Architecture Prize, because clearly that's the prize that, that I know best. And um, I'm more than happy to share with you everything that I can about the workings of the prize, how I've seen it over the past 10 years uh, uh, from personal experience, and even before that, based on my uh, role as an outsider looking at architecture and at prizes. Well, as you know, the uh, Architecture Prize was founded by the Pritzker family, Jay and Cindy Pritzker. Um, and probably, it, it's not really clear exactly why. I, I think there are probably several reasons. One, of course, um, they had uh, just completed the Peachtree Hyatt Hotel in Atlanta. And if you remember, that was a hotel that was the first one that had an atrium, an open atrium with glass elevators that could rise up and you could see the building as you were going up. And I think the great success of that building through its architecture was probably one of the seeds that the Pritzkers uh, thought about or one of the reasons that they thought about when they were approached, um, when they were approached to found the prize, um, I can tell you that um, uh, Carlton Smith, who was a Renaissance man, so to speak, from Southern Illinois, um, and um, uh, the then director of the National uh, Art Museum, um, approached first J. Paul Getty and tried to get him to fund the prize. Uh, he said no, so they went to the Pritzkers. And one anecdote that I was told, they, when the Pritzkers asked how much it would cost for the organization, well, the prize would be $100,000, but the organization would probably only be, I don't know, around $10,000 a year, which wasn't, back in 79. Um, and then when they, when they talked about who could be on the jury, uh, they started, uh, they talked about big names. And uh, I was told that Jay Pritzker said, fine, if you can get them all, we'll go for it. So they started with uh, a, a jury uh, of about five people, very recognized uh, um, uh, figures in the field of architecture, mostly architects. And um, of course, the first winner was a strong winner. That was Philip Johnson. The Pritzker Prize uh, has evolved a lot, and, uh, but other things have remained the same. And of course, one of the uh, special aspects about the prize is the prize ceremony. And this takes place at a different city every year, any place around the world. The decision is made by the Pritzker family, and today that is uh, Tom Pritzker and his wife Margot Pritzker, who are the backbone and the great supporters of the prize uh, today. Um, they're the ones who make the decision about where it will be. And we've been as far away as uh, Istanbul, Turkey, or Japan, um, Buenos Aires in Argentina, and as close to home as, um, as here, uh, close by in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, to uh, last year in Miami, and this year on Monday in New York City at the United Nations Building. What is another aspect of the Pritzker Prize? Well, I like to say it's lean and mean. It's, uh, the budget is a little bit more than $10,000 a year. Um, but we are a very small organization. Uh, as you know, I'm the executive director, and I devote part of my time to the prize, uh, probably about 20% of my time. We have one full-time uh, director of communications, and he does a lot with press and media and also helping plan the event in New York or wherever it might be. And then if we need anything else, uh, we um, rely on outside contractors 
or the support of Mr. Pritzker's office and his office uh, staff. So we are very lean. Not so mean, though. I think the great strength of the Pritzker Prize is the independent jury. The jury members represent themselves. They do not represent any organization or any body uh, uh, or any institution. They come to the jury for a minimum of three years, um, and then they're asked to submit their letter of resignation. Often it is not accepted. Um, and the reason that they're there for three years is because when you make a decision and you have to come back again and again and face it and say that you're part of it, it makes you very, very serious and very careful when you make the decision. Um, and I think that was part of the reason when the uh, guidelines were established to, to do it that way. We try to have a jury that is um, balanced uh, geographically. We have people from all over the world. Um, and we also try to have different professions. We have, and I'm sorry you can't see it so well on this chart, but um, the yellow line represents people in writing or publishing. The blue line are practicing architects. Uh, they may, may also be teachers. And then finally, the gray line uh, are patrons, philanthropists, business people who are in some way interested or clients in the, in the field of architecture. Right now, these are our jury members. And you can see how long they've been on the jury. We're very fortunate to have uh, Lord Palumbo uh, as the chair. And um, there will be changes uh, after, the, um, after the ceremony in New York. But um, Justice Stephen Breyer uh, is amazing. It, it's really something. And I'll, I'd like to tell you a little story about Justice Breyer. Um, he was asked to be on the jury in 2012. And he called me and said, Martha, you know, the meeting is coming up, and my first meeting. And really, I'm not an architect, and I haven't studied architecture. What, what can I contribute? And send me some publications, send me some information, and, and I want to be ready. Well, I, I tried to tell him, you know, it's not like the exam. You can't study the night before. You know, your life experience is what we're interested in. But in any case, I did send him some, some articles, some books. He devoured all of them before the meeting, every last one. I, I, I can't believe it. With his heavy schedule, he, was, he read everything. Um, and when he came to the meeting, uh, he, he, was quite, he was pretty quiet for most of the meeting. And the, the Pritzker jury, when they deliberate, um, they, they don't talk about architects or buildings. They start talking about the world and what's going on and where is architecture. And, and I like to think that it's like a circle that, that starts out very wide and it gets tighter and tighter and they finally make a decision. Well, this, this first time uh, they were discussing and discussing and the hours were going by. And Justice Breyer, who is uh, able to synthesize arguments incredibly well, uh, saw what was happening. We kept going, they kept going around in circles without coming to a conclusion. So he said to the jury, um, well, I'm not sure exactly where we are, so I think we should go around the table, and would everyone please summarize in just a minute their position? So they went around the table, and everyone said their piece. And then Justice Breyer said, OK, now I think we should all take a minute and think about what the other people have said. Soon there were smiles. And then the chair said, have we come to a conclusion? And everything was great. So. <laughs> 
Um, the, other, the other strength of the Pritzker Prize is that it's not based on uh, looking at photographs. Um, it's not based on looking at magazines or reading what other people say, but it's based on experiencing built works. And there are different ways that they do this. Uh, the jury travels together uh, about a week, 10 days each year. Um, and um, contrary to public opinion, we don't sort of fly around the world dropping off in buildings all over the world. But they go to an area. Uh, they try to understand the context. They try to understand uh, contemporary buildings there works by potential candidates, but also they look at historical buildings as well. And it's an opportunity for them to talk and to develop their common language about architecture and the way they see the world. Um, they also travel on their own um, for their professions. And when they do that, they share a lot of information with each other tips on what buildings to look at and where to go. Uh, so it's a body of knowledge that is built up over the years. The nominations process is open and easy. Um, and by that, I mean all you have to do is send me an email with the name of your proposal. And we ask that uh, we accept nominations from licensed architects all over the world. And if you want to send me a name and you're not a licensed architect, don't worry. I'm not going to ask for your transcript or anything like that. I will accept it if it's serious. Um, and you can also nominate yourself. So no problem there either. Um, I do the, I do the legwork, the research, uh, gathering the background information. And if I need help, um, I could approach an architect uh, uh, with the excuse of gathering information for our archive, which is extensive. And I also have many colleagues who are in publications and teaching throughout the world. And I call on them and ask them for their opinion. In addition to this open, uh, um, unsolicited nominations process, I also write about 250 uh, emails now every year to people throughout the world who may be critics, professors, politicians, museum directors, people in the world of culture, um, business institutions, and ask for their opinion. Uh, who would they like to nominate? And I also ask them, who is an up and coming architect or architects that the jury should keep their eye on? So if you don't mind, if we could just take a couple minutes uh, sort of as a tribute to the past uh, our, uh, Pritzker winners, um, we can just run through these uh, from 1979 to the present. And I think you'll see as we go through some of the evolution in the prize. Maybe the first ones were quite well known. Uh, uh, architects uh, in their field. They had done iconic buildings uh, many times uh, in the US, Europe, or in Japan. Um, and I think uh, as the years have gone on, we've seen, uh, we've seen an evolution of the prize. Um, clearly, there's great diversity in the winners enormous diversity in the types of buildings and their approach to architecture. This year, um, the, the only time there were two winners was Gordon Bunshaft and uh, Oscar Niemeyer. And that was in 88. They split the prize. And that was the only time, because after that, we realized that dividing the prize didn't have as much strength as granting it just to one person. Uh, one person, or in the case of two people or three people who work together. So the, um, we have had two people win in the case of Herzog and De Meuron, in the case of Sejima and Nishizawa. But other than that, there have usually been individual, uh, individual <laughs> authors. And of course, what more can we say about this wonderful building?
I think it's interesting because now these buildings look so natural next to the names of the, of the architects. But many of them, uh, when they won the prize, they had really done relatively few buildings. For example, in the case of Richard Meyer, he had just received the commission for the Getty but hadn't started it. Uh, Frank Gehry was quite unknown when he received it. Different is the case of Richard Rogers, who received it uh, later on in his career. Um, Jean Nouvel as well. He had some successes and some not such great successes, but was always a bold architect. Soto de Moura from uh, Portugal. And his Wang Shu's Ningbo History Museum. And Fry Otto, who knew that he had won the prize, but passed away before the ceremony. And this year, Alejandro Aravena. And if I might just say a couple words about Alejandro Aravena, because he is the most recent winner. Um, the Chilean architect, it's interesting because people say he's so young. Well, he's 48, I believe. Uh, and um, Richard Meyer was 48 when he won. Portson Park was 49. So he's in the range of the younger winners of the Pritzker Prize. Uh, a fabulous architect who has done buildings, many buildings on his university campus, but perhaps in the field of social housing has added another component to architecture, which is the ability to I would say to change the game. He was able to take the rules of social housing in Chile, the very strict requirements, the strict financing, the strict uh, size requirements, and was able to build what he calls half a house. So the first part is for the moment, and the other half that will come in the future is the aspirations, the middle class aspirations that people can have when they receive half a house. Because it's all set to have an addition that they can do themselves. And the theory behind this is that what is the most, what is the most important or the most expensive components of a house? And where is the value? It's the location, the structure, the plumbing, and the electricity. Those things you need from the beginning. You can't add them later. You can add the paint, you can add tiles, you can add another room, but you have to have the most important components and they have to be something that gives value and will increase in value over time, not decrease. And so in that sense, through his uh, office has become what I like to say a game changer and built over 2,500 uh, units of social housing in Chile and other South American countries. But more than that, I think his method is one that can be replicated by other architects. So therefore, uh, the sharing of knowledge and of experience. Well, what about new prizes? The ones I've talked about uh, until now are sort of the traditional prizes that reward excellence in a field. Well, I think that there are uh, some new prizes uh, for example, in the field of architecture, we can see prizes for different materials. Uh, for example, the wood prize in architecture, the stone prize in architecture, uh, things like that. There are categories or for typologies of buildings, um, and they try to reward segments of the field. There are prizes for women. And in this case, I think there are prizes because they're trying to um, correct society's view of, of architecture, or they're trying to highlight or shine a light on an area of the field that perhaps uh, uh, needs that added attention. And in this case, there are three main prizes that are uh, uh, given. Now, uh, Architects Journal and Architectural Review are together, um, and they give uh, three prizes. Um, the Jane Drew Award goes to an outstanding woman for her career. 
They give a prize for um, an architect for a building created, a woman architect for a building created in the last year, and also to emerging women architects to encourage them as they progress in their uh, professional practice. The Ital Cimenti Award, uh, two examples on the bottom. It is for women in architecture, uh, and it is for sort of mid-career architects whose work makes a substantial contribution to the society and has a broader message than just the individual building, but a building within the context. The first winner was Carla Juasaba from Brazil, very young architect in her 30s. And the building on the right is by uh, the winner uh, of uh, previous year, Ines Lobo from Portugal. And this year, on April 7th, the announcement of this year's winner will be made in Milan, Italy. Then in the field of sustainability, another one of those areas where the focus uh, or a light is being shown on an important aspect of architecture, the Lafarge Holsom Award is one for sustainability. Awards are granted for different <coughs> regions throughout the world, and then at the end of the year, the grand prize is awarded. And the Solar Decathlon uh, is, an, is a uh, prize um, where universities, uh, teams of students and their professors work together to build demonstration houses and houses that embody all aspects of sustainability, not just reduced energy use. Um, and they're built, uh, it could be uh, as examples that were built on the mall in Washington. We had the solar decathlon projects in uh, Madrid, Spain a few years ago. And the purpose is to uh, showcase the efforts by students and teachers, research put into practice, and also to create knowledge that can be shared by others for this field. Well, I think there is one new area uh, that I think prizes are getting into, and this would be new prizes for innovation. And I think, uh, well, throughout history, we have had prizes for innovation, and we have had uh, examples of uh, attempts or experiments to make the future house, to make different types of innovative architecture. Um, I think what's happening nowadays responds to a change in society and for two reasons. Uh, but I'll get that, to that in just a moment. Um, I think um, some of the prizes uh, could be uh, seen as being inspired, um, um, well, the X Prize, they can be in inspired. If we look back to, uh, for example, um, Charles Lindbergh, and his first nonstop flight between New York City and Paris back in 1927. That was a prize. And he was the underdog. Uh, and he, of course, we know that he uh, rode in the single engine Ryan air aircraft, the Spirit of St. Louis. And in that time, nine teams uh, participated and competed to win the Ortig Prize. And we know that Charles Lindbergh won it. Well, the US government is also trying to support uh, this type of initiative. And in 2010, um, it, published, um, it, it published its support of uh, prizes. And this was, again, echoed in 2013. And if, and if I could quote, the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation in collaboration with the Office of Science and Technology Policy. It works closely with federal agencies to promote the use of prizes and challenges to engage civic innovators, entrepreneurs, and citizen scientists to solve problems in areas of national priority, including energy, public safety, health, cybersecurity, and infrastructure. Well, what does this mean? 
I think it means that we're seeing a shift just as we see a shift in society for two reasons. One is the great spread of information that technology allows us to, to have. Through the internet, through all means of communication, we can talk to each other, we can share information instantaneously. This means that information is not the property of just an elite, just the university professors, but it really is out there for everybody. And the other thing is, uh, I think we're seeing a, um, of movement to the shared economy. And we, all have, and we all see examples of this from Uber to shared cars um, to um, sharing Airbnb, sharing your home, et cetera, et cetera. So these are examples of people coming together and working together for a goal. Now, in the case of Uber or Airbnb, it may be commerce and it may be uh, uh, one related to economics. But in the case of prizes, people can come together for the goal of the prize. And if we think back to the uh, X Prize and the idea to um, the X Prize for suborbital space flight, um, this is an example uh, of a prize where anyone can compete. There's not a call for nominations. And the goal is to do it, to create something, and prove that it can be done. And there's something different about these prizes, perhaps, than the traditional prizes in architecture and in other fields, because these prizes are bold and audacious. Um, they're, they define a problem, but they don't even attempt a definition of the solution. They leave that up to the participants. Um, these prizes are winnable by a small team. They have to have a reasonable frame, time frame. They usually give a short period, a year, two years, five years at the most for something like this. They're very telegenic. They're easy to communicate. They inspire people. They encourage people. They, um, they provide a vision, a hope. Uh, it drives investment. Um, and um, other things, they have a lot of activities around them. Other, they could have, rather than just waiting until the winner is announced, they have symposia, they have races, they have marathons, they have all kinds of things. Well, maybe you know about uh, this competition, um, which is in the same line or in the same vein. It was a competition for a robot. And it was sponsored in part by the Office of Naval Research and NASA. And it, the requirement was to build a uh, robot that could survey a sunken, uh, a mock-up uh, of a sunken submarine. And in this case, there is a book and a film, spare parts. And maybe you know the story. This was the case of some students who participated not in the student category. High school students participated uh, in the explorer level, the higher level, the university level. And the reason that they did that uh, was they figured, well, the students would probably, high school students from a poor school, inner city high school, would probably lose. And so why not compete with college people? At least they would feel good about the participation. Um, well, there were, um, there were teams from MIT, teams from Cambridge, and uh, our high school students from West Phoenix. And here they are. <laughs> Uh, of course, there's the brainy one. Uh, Lorenzo was called Lovato Loco, and he was the mechanic. There was the 18-year-old Luis Aranda, uh, and uh, a fourth member of the crew. Well, I don't have to tell you, they won. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a wonderful story. And I think it expresses this new idea in some prizes. 
prizes that are meant uh, to bring people together for the purpose of seeking a solution, seeking a real invention, seeking a real innovation. Um, we could talk about secondary reasons for it. How much are we spending on research and development in companies and in our institutions? Uh, on the other hand, um, with inspirational stories like this, um, maybe it's the way to go. And there they are with their robot. And finally, in the same vein in architecture is the Audi Urban Future Award. And it's an ideas competition to create new visions for cities and urban mobility. Um, and in 2010, uh, the 100,000 euros, or about uh, $110,000, went to a Mexican team headed by Jose Castillo. Jose Castillo is an architect, and he uh, is a wonderful architect in Mexico, also teaches at Harvard. And what he developed was not a building, was not infrastructure, but it was an application, uh, an app uh, that would help in terms of computers and, uh, I'm sorry, commuters and uh, traffic. And again, his invention was based on a shared economy because it relied on the residents participating and um, allowing their data to be input into the system. So it's a recent example based on the model of shared economy, which was able to assist users in real time to make decisions about their commute. So to conclude, over the years, I've seen prizes come and go <laughs> and come again and again. Um, and today, there are great opportunities and challenges for any award. Vast amounts of information are, from all over the world are available. And the power of technology allows us to receive it quickly. However, not all information is of value. And therefore, the jury has a very important job to do. All juries do. They have to make good decisions. But more than that, they have to, be, they have to explain why they have made the decision. And we, as members of the public, we should ask, what are the goals of a prize? Who is behind it? Who is on the jury? Does the, does the prize contribute to the debate? Does it improve the built environment? And just to finish off, I'd like to, um, I'd like to remember uh, uh, the thoughts of Robert Brunner back in 2006. And if I could paraphrase him, he said, we should give prizes not because we need more celebrities, more notoriety, or feel good esteem building. We don't give prizes for the sake of individuals, but for the sake of the larger community. Prizes should continue to remind everyone of ideals and virtues, the things we value in society. So hats off to the Natur Sculpture Prize for, re for rewarding the important area of sculpture and for reminding us of its importance for the community and the broader society. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you want questions or... So I'm curious about why you don't have any architecture of the story as a critic side of that. We, we do have critics. Right now, um, Christine Fryrice. Um, she trained first as a journalist. Um, and she um, was a newspaper journalist uh, in her early career. She then founded Eddie's Gallery for Architecture. And that's the longest running independent non-commercial architecture gallery in, in Europe. So she is a critic. 
Ada Louise Huxtable was the longest jury member. She was 18 years, I believe, on the jury. And we all know Ada Louise Huxtable as an outstanding critic. Um, also, uh, Karen Stein, uh, editor and writer, was on for about seven years. And Yuhani Palazma, although he is a uh, he, he, he was a practicing architect. He still is a professor and a writer. Perhaps not a critic, but, but certainly uh, an author uh, in terms of history theory of, of architecture. Thank you. Yes? So you said you've seen prices come and go. Yeah. So what causes them to go? Well. I, I can tell you about one, the, the, the Carlson Prize for Architecture. Um, that was when it came out, I think that was probably, uh, I think it was late 80s, early 90s. And the Carlson Brewing Company um, established the prize, $250,000, the, the largest, in, and still today is the, the largest purse ever. Um, and it had three cycles. And then there was a change on the board of directors of the brewing company, and they decided to get rid of the prize. So that's one reason. So, yeah. Any, anything else? Maybe I could just share with you one, one, one anecdote. I, I, the best part of my job is the fact that I get to call the winner and tell that person. And it's very hard. I can't just call somebody on the phone and say, hey, this is Martha Thorne from the Pritzker Prize, because they'll, they'll say, well, you know, they might figure out if I speak to um, uh, someone in the office who's not the winner, or I speak to uh, um, the receptionist or the person who answers the phone. So I'm always thinking about ways to call somebody and what excuse I can use. And when I called um, Mendes de Rocha, I couldn't call him immediately after the jury had made their decision. I wrote an email and said, I have some images of your work in the Pritzker archive, and they're very unclear, and I need help in identifying them. May I call you tomorrow? And he wrote back and said, well, speak with my assistant. Uh, <laughs> he can help you. And I wrote back and said, no, these are, this is very complicated. I need to speak with you. So I called him, and uh, he said, um, and I said, um, first I asked him if he wanted to speak in English or Spanish. I, I don't speak Portuguese. And uh, I don't know. So maybe he said English, I'm great. And I said, do you know why I'm calling? And he said, yes, because something about photos that you need to identify. And I said, well, no, frankly, I'm calling to say that you have been selected the uh, 2006 Pritzker Architecture Prize winner. He said, what? <laughs> and I said, you have been selected. <laughs> And he said, what? <laughs> and I said, Paolo, don't you understand me? And he said, yes, but it sounds so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you.